It's thinking. All right, I believe we are officially live. Hello, Artie peoples, and welcome to another episode of Jerry's Live. My name is Emmy Klein, and as you can see, we have a, a guest with us today. Somebody Hello, everyone. Hello. You guys know? Yes, Jeff Olson, the Art Education Director for Royal Talents of North America. We're so excited you're here. I'm excited to be here. Yes. First, so, first gig in uh, uh, 2023 for Jerry's Live. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah it is, isn't it? Oh, man. Yeah. The whole year is going to fly by, I swear. But I am very excited to have you here. Jeff has an amazing show for us all to watch. It's some of my favorite colors. I cannot lie. It's They're just, mwah, lovely colors. But uh, before we officially get into it, it, today's class is JL279. So if you are interested in anything that Jeff is about to show us, make sure you go to the website, jerrysartorama.com and type in that class code, JL279, in the search bar, and then everything should come up in the teacher's cart and you can check it out that way. So um, the other thing to note before we officially hand it off to Jeff, we have a giveaway, guys. Not we. Jeff has a giveaway. Jeff has an amazing giveaway. So pay attention as per usual. And uh, we'll have to do the giveaway at the end of the show. And uh, without further ado, Jeff, I'm going to hand it off to you for the presentation. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. I am broadcasting today from my studio in Seattle, Washington. Excited to be here. And today I'm going to be talking about oil paint, specifically the Rembrandt uh, transparent oxide. So I'm going to scoot a little closer here. Oh, there we go. There we go. And I've got a PowerPoint that I want to go through first. And just a hint, uh, the question for the giveaway is going to be from the presentation. So that's kind of like my bribe to get you to pay attention as I go through that. And then once we're finished with that, uh, we're going to jump into the demo. I got a couple steps going to show you some of these wonderful colors and how you can utilize them on your own. And, uh, and then, of course, answer questions. And then, uh, as always, you know, Emmy, fire me whatever questions come across when I'm uh, doing the presentation. Happy to answer those as we go along. Absolutely. We will. All right. So <laughs> here we go. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and you should see the presentation come up there. There we go. See it okay? Yes, I do. Thank you. All right. Rembrandt Artist Oils, the Transparent Oxide. So today we're going to have a, a brief talk on oils in general. Uh, and then I'm going to spend the final part of the presentation speaking directly to these wonderful pigments. They're pigments that have been around for millennia. Uh, and uh, uh, just embraced by artists for generations. And there's some unique qualities to them that make them so uh, versatile yeah. in a variety of applications. Uh, so I know whether you're a portrait painter or a landscape painter, there are gonna be things here for you to enjoy. So let's go ahead and get into uh, a little of the background on who Royal Talents are. So we are a Dutch manufacturer of artist materials. I'm going to show you a picture here. This is the very first Talons building, Emmy, in Appledorn. We're actually still on the same real estate, same location. Really? The building is long gone, uh, but uh, we're still in the same location. Uh, Appledorn is about an hour east by train from Amsterdam. So if you've ever been to Amsterdam and the central terminus right there, just hop on a train and head east in about an hour, a couple stops, uh, you'll be right in Appledorn. If you get off the train there, it's literally walking distance from the train station. Super convenient. Uh, and then uh, I wanna show you this great picture I have of some of the original Rembrandt oil paints. So we began manufacturing the Rembrandt oils in 1899, the same year that the company was established. And here you can see some of the original tubes from back then. If you ever get a chance to visit Royal Talents, we have this uh, building on the side, which we call the Experience Center. And it, about every product that we make is there. It's like uh, Willy Wonka, right? And, the, and you get the, the golden ticket and you go in there and get a play with anything you want to. But there's also this cool little museum space, if you will, that shows a lot of the different graphics and products from uh, our 120 plus year uh, tradition. This is a picture from the 1930s. This is the milling floor. 
And it's really cool because today everything's electric powered, but back then everything was steam powered. And you can see those fun belts that are coming down and running the paint mills. Those are the paint mills where the oil paint was made back then. Uh, I love these old pictures. Some of the old pictures that we have are so cool because many of the workers are wearing the Dutch wooden shoes uh, in the factory. It's pretty cool. How cool is that? So you, if you noticed on that first picture, it was just called Talons when we were founded. So in 1949, we became royal. And it was because of this individual. This is Queen Wilhelmina. She bestowed upon us the royal predicate and we became paint makers to the queen. It was for our cultural and economic contributions to the Netherlands. Uh, didn't hurt that she was a amateur painter herself. And the summer palace for the Dutch royal family is also in Appledorn. So there were lots of connections there. So we've been royal. Uh, ever since. And in 2015, Royal Talents North America was established. So we had been selling our products in North America since the 1930s, but always through a third party distributor. So in 2015, we established our own distribution center and customer service center in Northampton, Massachusetts. Uh, and it's just been a real convenience for all of the artists and our retail partners throughout Canada and the US. And that is who my employer is, Royal Talents North America. And if you want to learn more about either, there are the websites and the hashtags down below. Uh, and as uh, Emmy said, I'm the Art Education Director for Royal Talents North America. I'm also an exhibiting artist for more than 30 years now. I've been in the art materials industry for more than 20 years, wearing many hats from retail to manufacturing. But education, of course, is my passion. Uh, and then I spent 10 years as a university educator teaching studio art and art history for almost a decade. And if you'd like to learn more about me and my work, uh, you can visit jeffolsonart.com or jeffolsonart on Instagram. All right, let's take a look at what we got planned for today. So a brief history of oils. I always like to share some of the history of the materials. I think it gives us a connection to the artists of the past and just a, a more intimate relationship with the materials themselves when you know where they come from. Uh, then I'm going to talk about what a binder is and specifically the binder for oil paint. Uh, binders are super important. They're what really determines the working properties of the material. So we're going to spend a little time looking at the drying oils that are used as the binder for oil paint. Then we're going to talk about pigments. Uh, briefly, I'm going to share with you some of the different categories of pigments but I really wanna focus in on the pigments uh, that are today's feature. So iron oxide red and iron oxide yellow, we're gonna take a look at and learn a, bit, a little bit about their history and how they uh, have developed over the years. Uh, and then I'm gonna spend some time describing some of the features of the transparent oxides that we're gonna be demoing with today. Uh, and then we have our giveaway. So uh, at the end of that, uh, I'll have a question uh, and everybody's name is going to go into a hat and I'll let Emmy kind of go over that at the end when we get to that phase. But I'm excited to give away some sets of the transparent oxides, uh, along with some of the Rembrandt oil paper. So something to paint on as well. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we'll have the demo uh, for the last portion. All right, let's jump into it. So oil painting. So a lot of folks think of oil painting as beginning during the Renaissance, the 15th century in Europe. And actually, oil painting dates back much earlier than that. The oldest known oil paintings were discovered in Afghanistan in 2001. There were this wonderful uh, series of murals that were painted in caves in the Bamiyan region of Afghanistan. They depicted the life uh, of Buddha. And when they did an analysis of the paint, it turns out they were a mixture of walnut oil and poppy seed oil as the binder with pigments, so essentially an oil paint. Uh, this was a pivotal location on the Silk Road, uh, the trading route between East and West. So there were artisans coming from China, from India, through Afghanistan at that time, uh, into Europe and back. So we're not sure if this particular painting uh, medium developed in Afghanistan or if it was brought from somewhere else, or if the artist came from somewhere else and just used the materials that were uh, available or at hand. So we're not sure on the history, but based on the sophistication of the application, it's almost uh, certain that there are probably other examples, even earlier examples of oil painting out there yet to be discovered. Uh, then, of course, we do get to Europe in the 15th century. Uh, oil paint was actually in use before then, uh, as early as the 12th century in Northern Europe, but it was really the 15th century where we see the virtuoso handling of the medium 
uh, by early Netherlandish artists, uh, including pictured here, uh, what we think is a self-portrait of Van Eyck, and of course, one of the panels from the Ghent altarpiece in the background. Uh, Van Eyck, uh, other artists like Roger van der Weyden uh, were 15th century painters, uh, and their work really represented a turning point in the adoption of oils as a major painting medium. And there are a couple reasons specifically, and some of them are credited specifically to Jan van Eyck, and that was uh, being able to polymerize the oil. So they actually would eat, heat up the linseed oil uh, to uh, make it thicker. They would add resins like pine resin to increase the viscosity as well. Uh, they also had access to solvents like turpentine. Now turpentine uh, was around, but not widely uh, used and wasn't used in the same way as Van Eyck and the, and the Netherland painters did apply it. So that was something that was new for oil painters, gave them a powerful new solvent. Uh, to use. And then uh, also they uh, were using drying agents that we refer to as cicatives. Uh, cicatives can be lead or copper salts, and these were added to the paint to help them dry more quickly. So all these things came together uh, in the work of these artists in the 15th century. Prior to that in Europe, the dominant mediums were fresco, which is painting into wet plaster, which we see pictured here on the left, and on the right, tempera painting, where you take the dry pigments and mi mix them with egg yolk. They're both wonderful mediums and have some really unique qualities to them, but they were very limited. Uh, the drying time uh, was very short, so you had a limited time to work on them. I don't know if you've ever worked with tempera or have seen the technique, but it's a very delicate process that requires a lot of uh, really detailed layering. Uh, the color range of these two mediums was limited as well, the tonal range. Uh, so oil paints really offered artists a new way to express themselves. And here we see this wonderful painting by van der Weyden, uh, the wonderful detail and the nuances is in color, uh, just really dynamic and, and exhibited what was possible with oil. So the binder itself, the drying oil binder, allows you to make the pigments more translucent or allow the artists at this time to make them more translucent, allow them to apply their colors in thin layers, what we call glazing. And that's literally kind of trapping light in the surface of the paint film, gives these paintings that kind of radiance that they have, uh, the rich glowing color that we associate with old masterworks. Uh, the versatility of the paint, the fact that it stayed wet longer, allowed the artist to rework or work into areas over and over again. Uh, and it really helped them to realize the vision of the Renaissance artist, you know, combining this extraordinary naturalistic detail with brilliant color. Uh, Van Eyck referred to it as the beauty of earthly things. Uh, and this is the image of uh, van der Weyden's descent from the cross. So just wonderful possibilities uh, that oil presented to artists in the 15th century. And it became the dominant painting form in the West uh, from that period forward. Right, so a, a very often forgotten important part of the development of oil painting uh, was the invention of the paint tube. So I don't know if you've seen these before, I mean, but these are little pig uh, bladders. And this is how artists used to store their paint before tubes. This is actually from the studio of Gainsborough in Great Britain. So you would go to a colorist and they would mix up the paint for you and, and put it in these, or you would be mixing it in your own studio and putting these. You could travel with these, uh, but they weren't the most convenient uh, method of transportation for your paint. Uh, you see the little wooden cork there and it was tied around the cork. So coming up with the tube really changed the game. Uh, the gentleman responsible for that uh, is pictured here. This is John Rand, and he introduced the first paint tube in 1841. Here's one of those original tubes. Uh, and this really changed the way artists approached their work. And it also democratized oil painting, if you will. So it made uh, plein air painting much more easy to achieve and accomplish. A lot of folks uh, attribute the development of the paint tube as contributing to Impressionism, for example. Uh, but it also made oil paint accessible to the general public. So we have a real popularity or embracing of the medium by enthusiasts. So we see plein air painting groups popping up all over Europe. Uh, and in the US, uh, we see uh, enthusiasts, you know, taking classes, joining each other for groups and clubs. And some of those clubs are still around today. Uh, so it really changed the landscape of who was painting. It also introduced modern manufacturing techniques. So I mentioned colorists and these kind of small batches of colors that were made before this time. The invention of the tube in the latter part 
of the 19th century really marks the beginning of the manufacture of paints uh, by groups like Royal Talents, who was established in 1899, so not long after this. And that helped improve the overall quality of oil paints, the consistency uh, of them from batch to batch. Uh, so the, the tube really did change oil paints and how artists interacted with their materials. All right, so let's talk about the paint itself and, and the binder specifically. So all paints have a binder. And the main or, or two main things that binders do are to suspend and adhere. Uh, but first, let's talk about some of the general uh, principles of a binder. So the main characteristic uh, of any type of paint, as I mentioned before, uh, is within the uh, binder that's used. So all the working properties that you know about oil paint are determined by the linseed oil binder. Everything that acrylics do are because of the binder and acrylics, the acrylic polymer emulsion watercolors, gum arabic, all these different binders dictate how the paint works and behaves. The pigments are the same. Those are universal. Uh, so it's really the binders that determine the unique qualities of each material. In general, and this is kind of a, a definition, if you were to look this up online or in a dictionary, the binders are a liquid substance that harden through a chemical or physical process, and they barn the particle, particles, in this case, uh, pigments. Uh, so that binding takes place. This is a true statement in general, but there are some binders that don't do this. And gum arabic is an example. So gum arabic is the main binder in watercolor. And when you brush the watercolor on the surface of the paper, most of the gum arabic is actually absorbed into the surface of the paper. There's no discernible paint film that's developed. Uh, so there isn't uh, uh, a universal definition. Uh, this one would apply universally to all binders. Uh, the primary function, as I mentioned above, that all binders do have to do is to suspend and adhere. So suspension uh, has to do with how the pigments in the binder interact. So binders are kind of like sand. If you stirred them up in water, they wouldn't dissolve. They'd sink down to the bottom after the, the water settled. Uh, so in paint, you need a binder that's going to suspend or hold those pigments in place after they've been mixed. So all binders have to be able to suspend the pigments. We call that a suspension. Uh, when we're uh, talking about what paint is. Uh, and then secondly, uh, they need to adhere. So you want to paint on a surface, right? And it needs to stick to it. So the paint has to, or the binder has to be an excellent adhesive. So suspend and adhere are qualities of all binders. Uh, in oils, the most commonly used binders are what we refer to as the drying oils. So let's take a look. You can see this picture here in the background is actually some linseed oil that's being pressed in a machine. So the seeds are pressed at high pressure uh, and come out in that wonderful kind of amber uh, oil that we're all familiar with. All right, let's look at some of the drying oils that are used in oil painting. Uh, first and foremost, the most common, of course, is linseed oil and has been for over 500 years. Linseed uh, are the seeds from the flax plant. You can see them pictured here. A lot of folks ask me, why don't we call it flaxseed oil? And we actually do. Lin is the old English or old Norse term for flax. Uh, so when we say linseed, we're essentially saying flaxseed. So linseed oil, most popular since the Renaissance. Uh, it is probably uh, universally the best of the drying oils uh, for a couple different reasons. One, that it dries relatively fast compared to the others. I know that sounds funny because oil paints can take up to six months to dry, right? Six to nine months, depending on your paint film. Uh, but compared to other drying oils, that's relatively fast. So you've got that part. The other is the paint film that uh, develops uh, over the process of oxidation over time is the most durable of all the drying oils. So you have the most permanent paint film when you're working with linseed oil. There is a downside to linseed oil. And that is that it can yellow over time and discolor lighter colors like white. Uh, and the more linseed oil you add into your mixture, if you're adding mediums, the more this effect can then come about. Uh, typically, you don't see it uh, when you're painting direct with the material and uh, just adding some solvent, for example. Um, and it can take a while for this effect to have an impact on the painting. Uh, but one of the things that we do to uh, alter that is to add safflower oil. So safflower oil is another drying oil. Uh, it's not used a lot in the making of paint all by itself, like linseed oil is. Linseed's a really great binder for making paint. Safflower can be used uh, for that, uh, but it makes a, a softer paint film, so not quite as hard or durable. 
as linseed oil. So that's why often it's mixed with linseed oil. Uh, it is slower drying uh, and non-yellowing. So because of that non-yellowing factor is why it's mixed with the linseed oil, uh, especially in whites. And you'll also notice that your whites sometimes take longer to dry. Often that's because of the safflower oil that's mixed in with them. Next, we have walnut oil. This was a popular drying oil used during the Renaissance. I mentioned its use in those caves in Afghanistan. It's an excellent binder uh, for oil painting uh, and making your own paints. Uh, it's a little lighter than the linseed oil, uh, dries relatively the same speed. It makes a very good and durable paint film. Uh, it's non-yellowing, so a lot of folks prefer it for that. There are some brands out there that actually use walnut oil still as the binder in the making of their paint. Um, it's used as a solvent as a solvent substitute by many artists, and it's used in a lot of mediums. Artists like to add a little walnut oil into their paint while they're painting. Uh, the one thing you have to watch out for with walnut oil is it can go rancid in your studio. And you'll know when that happens because it smells like there's a body hiding somewhere in there. Uh, <laughs> so you wanna make sure uh, that you uh, are using good studio practice uh, with that and making sure those bottles are secured. And some folks even refrigerate them. It depends on how quickly you go through it. Once it's mixed with your paint and dried on the surface, you don't have to worry about that. It's really in the container uh, over time in your studio. And then finally, I want to mention poppy seed. I mentioned them uh, in terms of the uh, paintings, again, those murals in Afghanistan. So it's a very old binder for oils. Uh, it is non-yellowing also. Uh, it's used a lot in the making of whites and varnishes particularly. And there are some great poppy seed mediums today to add to uh, your paint. Uh, to change the working properties. It's not used a lot as a standalone binder anymore for oil paints, uh, but a great medium uh, that a lot of artists embrace uh, in their process. So these are the four. Oh, go ahead, Nimi. Now, as I said, we have a couple of questions about oils in general. Sure. sure. Um, one, because I mean, you did also mention like walnut uh, in particular. Are any of these edible? Like, can you use them in your kitchen? No. <laughs> no. The refining process is different. Yeah, the refining process is different. So the, the products you find at the grocery store on the, you know, on the organic section, the flax oil, the walnut oil, the safflower oil for cooking, they're, they're a different grade of the material. Um, they are not carcinogens or toxins in that sense. So you're not going to be poisoned by them, but I certainly wouldn't recommend using them in the kitchen. Yeah, usually... The, the artist grade oils are not food grade. So they, they haven't been purified as much. Right, they're, right? Not, they're not edible. They're not to that level. Uh, and um, the processing of them is just is very different, yeah. Yeah. Um, now the other question I have is, uh, is there a certain like linseed oil or at any, actually any of these oils are any of them in particular to make uh, their own paint with? Is that is something that you're like looking for in particular? Right, right. So linseed oil is probably the most common and your best bet. A lot of folks really enjoy cold pressed linseed oil. So that's the first press of the flaxseed. Um, uh, that's a traditional binder uh, for making your own paint. But any type of refined linseed oil is going to be an excellent binder for making your own paint. Walnut oil is also uh, great for making your own paint. Safflower and poppy seed you can, but they're not ideal. Uh, you're gonna have more success with linseed oil and then next walnut oil in terms of the consistency of the paint. And then um, I have, I, as we're talking, there's more questions popping up, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> is it okay to mix the different oils while you're painting? Like if you have uh, linseed oil based paints and then you want to use something else? Yeah, absolutely. They, they are interchangeable. They work well together. Um, just uh, have uh, an understanding of their different characteristics. I mentioned some of those, right? So you've got the uh, safflower oil that's slower drying, uh, for example. Uh, so you don't want to add safflower oil to those lower layers of your painting. Uh, if you're building up glazes, for example. Um, so there are some characteristics of each that you need to be informed about. Um, but beyond that, they work fantastic together. And, and I mentioned walnut oil and poppy seed oil are in a lot of really popular mediums that artists add to their paint. And their paint is usually a, a linseed oil binder. So no problems working with them together. Just be aware of things like drying time, 
uh, and yellowing and, and so on. All right, and then the last question that I have for the oils here, uh, can you use the food grade like kitchen oils in your paintings? So um, I'm gonna say no, I'm not gonna recommend that. Um, in a pinch, you, you could use that to make paint. What uh, I'm concerned about, and, and I'm sure other folks out there would, would say this too, is that we're not sure what the integrity of the paint film over time is going to be like. Um, so while these are drying oils uh, in, in your kitchen, that's not what they're made for. And so uh, you're gonna see differences in the way that they're polymerized or pressed or filtered. And, and uh, so it's just not a safe bet. You're, you're gonna do much better buying the materials that are meant for painting and keeping the things in the kitchen out of the studio. But if you don't care about how long the painting is gonna last, if you don't care about the archival quality, you're just having fun, you're just playing around, why not experiment, go for it. You know, artists are always breaking rules. Uh, so, uh, so there's my there's my two bits. One as a manufacturer, don't do it. One as an artist, you know, if you want to have some fun and see what's going to happen, see what's going to happen. Very nice. All right, I'm sure we're going to have more questions, but I'm feeling if we keep going, we're just never going to get to the end of your presentation. So yeah, we got we got to do we got to do the demo. <laughs> yes, we have more amazing things to see. So yeah, and we I'll can let's... answer questions while we're going through that too. Oh yeah. All right. Perfect. All right, so those are the so those are those are the binder, those are the oils. So let's talk about the color. All right, so pigments. Pigments are the preferred coloring agents for artist materials. Here are some of the bags of pigments in our facility uh, in the Netherlands. This photograph does not do them justice. These colors simply radiate light out of these bags. It's like somebody put a light bulb in them and they're glowing from a distance. It really is fantastic. The richness uh, and the quality of the pigments that are used in the making of the paint. Uh, the way that we categorize most pigments is based on their origin. So what's the origin of the particular material? Uh, and there are three different categories we give uh, for that. Uh, the first is organic. So these are pigments that find their source in plants or animals. Um, carmine is a notorious one. It's the cochineal beetle that sacrifices its life uh, for the color chimon traditionally. Uh, today we have a synthetic version of it. Uh, uh, Tyrian purple, imperial purple is the, the murex, the, the Mediterranean sea snail was used by that by the Phoenicians to create a wonderful purple color, uh, another example uh, of that. Uh, so organic are all the plant and animal pigments. Next we have the inorganic pigments and these are the minerals. So these are the rocks beneath our feet. Uh, so the pigments we're gonna be talking about today are inorganic pigments and uh, Probably the most famous is, is ultramarine, which originally was based on lapis, a semi-precious stone from the mountains of Afghanistan. It was the Italians who gave it the name ultramarine, uh, but that's an example of a mineral-based pigment. Some of the oldest pigments we know of uh, that we have discovered in archaeological sites and, and ancient uh, Neolithic prehistoric works uh, were used. We're using mineral-based pigments, so they're so they're very durable, very old, uh, original color, if you will. Uh, and then synthetic pigments. Um, so synthetic pigments begin as organic or inorganic, and then they're synthesized, they're cooked up. Uh, sometimes it's just uh, heating them up to change their color or their working properties. Sometimes they're exposed to other pigments or other chemicals to change their working properties or their color. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways to synthesize a pigment. Most of the pigments we use today are synthetic pigments. Uh, the main reasons we do that uh, is to strengthen uh, the longevity of the color. Uh, we make them more light fast uh, and we're looking for alternatives to uh, ones that are carcinogenic or uh, are just rarer or more expensive. So there are different reasons for synthesizing them. It isn't just a modern uh, manifestation of color making. Now, artists have been alchemists for centuries and uh, some great examples of older synthetic colors include Naples yellow. True Naples dates all the way back to ancient Babylon. It was used by the Egyptians in glass making. Uh, another very popular synthetic color from the past is lead white, the most popular white during the Renaissance and probably all the way up to the 20th century in oil painting. And they synthesized lead by submerging it in clay pots of vinegar, packing cow dung around them, getting the lead to oxidize and create the white flakes that were ground into the pigment. Uh, so I, I found a couple examples there of synthetic 
pigments uh, through history. So this is how we categorize them. So let's focus on the pigments uh, that play an important role in the colors we're going to be demonstrating today. So first I want to talk about iron oxide red. Uh, pigment red 101, pigment red 102. So these are the color index numbers uh, that are associated with these two colors. PR 101 is the synthetic version, which you'll find in almost all colors manufactured today. Uh, there are some examples of PR 102, which is the natural iron oxide red. A few companies are using this, or sometimes it's mixed together with the PR 101. Uh, so it's a very ancient color with a lot of names. Uh, it's called red ochre. It's called bloodstone or sanguine. Uh, kaput mortem, uh, which literally translates as deadhead. Of course, terra rosa <laughs> is a term that a lot of folks uh, are familiar with. Venetian red is another very popular term for this pigment, and many, many more. Uh, it's actually probably used uh, in more colors than you would think if you start looking at the tube. A lot of burnt siennas, for example, include PR101 sometimes. So it, it can play a part in a lot of different colors, ones that are obvious and ones not so obvious. A uh, natural iron oxide, uh, the PR-102, is literally found around the globe. It can be seen in cave paintings in Spain uh, and the Aboriginal dream paintings of Australia. Uh, it has historically literally been dug right out of the earth and formed into sticks, uh, chalks, and mixed into paints. Uh, these pigments have been favored since prehistory. I think some of the oldest examples are in Zambia. I think they were 200,000 years old, uh, some of the paintings that this pigment was used for. Uh, and then they were preferred uh, as the main drawing pigment during the Renaissance. So a really long and rich history used by artists uh, for centuries. Uh, the uh, iron oxide themselves, uh, I mentioned before, are inorganic. So they're a mineral-based pigment. Uh, they range from a rich red brown to a dark red violet, which you can see here in the example. Uh, they have a very high iron, iron content, and that's what makes them red. Uh, in the 18th century, we see the introduction of the synthetic iron oxide, the PR-101. Uh, there was a French scientist, uh, jean Etoine Astier, uh, who uh, perfected the synthesizing of this pigment. Uh, synthetic iron oxide pigments initially went through a refining process, so a lot of the impurities and other minerals were taken out of it, so that was part of the process. Uh, iron salts were later introduced, uh, reducing any type of organic compounds that were found in there and making for a cleaner refined color. Uh, so that's just kind of a quick synopsis of how the synthesis of these colors transpired. And it continued to change and evolve and is continuing to evolve as well. Uh, so this is a science that hasn't stopped. We have folks in the lab, as many uh, other manufacturers do, always looking for ways to make the paint better, richer, uh, brighter, uh, and so on. So that's PR 101 or iron oxide red. We're going to be using that today. Next, we have iron oxide yellow, which is PY42. Uh, and then the natural uh, uh, original inorganic is PY43. So PY42 is the color that you're going to see most often on tubes of paint today. And that's a synthetic version. So iron oxide yellow uh, is more commonly referred to uh, as yellow ochre or ochre in general. Uh, there are many other names for ochres, uh, usually based on the hue, the uh, production location, where the mining was taking place, uh, or sometimes just the manufacturing method. You can see some examples of different uh, iron oxide yellows uh, or ochres in this image here. Uh, ochre pigments are plentiful uh, also around the globe. Uh, many of the best or the, or the most intense are found in Australia, especially the Western Desert area. Uh, they occur at many archaeological sites there, as well as still being used today by indigenous uh, cultures. Uh, the practice of ochre painting has been prevalent among indigenous Australian people for more than 40,000 years. Uh, and this image in the background is actually an image of an artist working with ochre in Australia. Yellow iron oxide pigments have been uh, part of ancient history, and because pigments often still use their traditional name, a multitude of languages have intermixed, becoming an almost impossible list of varied phrases. If you go on the color index site and look at all the names for iron oxide yellow, the list just goes on and on and on. It's really pretty incredible uh, how much this pigment, this color has played a role in the art uh, around the planet. Uh, oil paints uh, using PY42, which is the synthetic version, and PY43, which is the natural version, exist in almost any shade of yellow, orange, red, and brown. They're used a lot. Um, a few paint brands use a mixture of both, 
uh, to making them. But essentially, they are the same chemically. If you look at their chemical breakdown, they're identical. Uh, so really, it's a single pigment that we're talking about and a, a level of refining one versus the other. So the wonderful uh, ochres there, beautiful color. All right, let's talk about the transparent oxides that we're going to be working with specifically today and some of the things that you can expect there. Uh, so the first question is, they get, how do they become transparent? Traditionally, these pigments are very opaque. Uh, have a high tinting strength. Uh, anybody who's used yellow ochre or, or, or a, a terra rosa or something like that knows this, um, but uh, we are able to manipulate that opacity. And a lot of the different things that contribute to that are the pigment particle size itself. Uh, so a typical oil pigment is ground down to about 30 microns, 25 to 35 microns. A micron, to give you some relativity there, a, a red blood cell is about five microns in diameter. A human hair is about 60 microns in diameter. The uh, smaller the particle size, the more transparent the paint is going to be. The larger the particle size, the more opaque it's going to be. So the changing or milling the paint can change its opacity. Uh, the amount of grinding, which is the milling, also the formulation, uh, which is usually proprietary, uh, along with the method of manufacture uh, where it's being made at, can contribute to the opacity. Uh, the specific formulation, the binder uh, has an impact. Uh, the opacity or transparency can be Im impacted by the binder used, whether you're using oil or an acrylic polymer or gum arabic, for example. Uh, sometimes the uh, oxides themselves have unique mineral contents that lend to making them either opaque or more transparency, and that includes some of the impurities or additives that can be uh, put into the mix as you're manufacturing the paint. Uh, but primarily, you're going to find that it's the particle size and the grinding of the paint uh, that play the biggest role. Uh, these are extremely transparent. They're our most transparent uh, rating, and I'll talk about that here in a second and incredibly durable. Uh, we mentioned some of the uh, wonderful examples from history, from prehistory, where these pigments are used, uh, but just incredibly durable, incredibly light, fast colors when you're working with them. Uh, they are ideal for glazing. Uh, because they're transparent, you don't have to add a lot of medium to get some wonderful transparent colors in your glazing techniques. Uh, they really allow a lot of wonderful uh, light to pass through, creating just this marvelous depth and glowing quality. Uh, they are very popular colors uh, to use for glazing uh, throughout the history of oil painting uh, and for good reason. Uh, they have a very high tinting strength without overpowering. And this is the transparent side of it. So the opaque ochres, uh, they, uh, they can really overpower a mixture. If you've ever tried to mix yellow ochre, for example, with another color, it can be very overpowering. So these transparent versions really continue to give you the great tinting strength without wiping out the other color that they're mixed with. And I'm going to show you some of that today. And then finally, uh, mixing with primary colors. Uh, so before we talk about layering them in, in transparencies, you can also mix them with other colors directly and create a really wonderful palette of rich and warm tertiary colors, uh, grays and blacks too. The, the red, uh, for example, the transparent red oxide mixed with ultramarine blue makes an incredible gray and black. Uh, so I'll give you some examples of that today. So those are some of the things to look for while we're working with the material. All right, let's look at some of the breakdown of the color. So here's transparent oxide yellow. Uh, you can see it's got excellent light fast rating, 100 plus years under museum light conditions. That's what those little plus signs stand for. The opacity is transparent. Other symbols that you would see here, if it was opaque, that little square would be completely black. If it were semi-opaque, it would be half black. Uh, if it were semi-transparent, it would have a line through the middle of it, but completely transparent, you see this empty uh, square. Uh, it's a series three color for us. Uh, and so that's the middle of the pack in terms of its cost and its exclusivity. Uh, and then the pigment used is PY42, so the synthetic uh, iron oxide yellow. And we get to transparent oxide orange, color number 273. So these color numbers up above, those are our proprietary numbers. And it's really great to know these. Uh, that means that any of our materials, whether it's a soft pastel or a tube of oil paint, if it says 273 on it, it's the same pigment. Uh, so a really nice tool that you can use there. 
Uh, here we see, again, excellent light fastness, completely transparent series three. And here we have a mixture of the PY42 and the PR101. So we have the uh, red and the yellow mixed together to give us this wonderful transparent oxide orange. By far the most popular, our transparent oxide red 378 is our best selling color in North America, even more than tubes of white. Uh, it is just a wildly popular color with many artists. Uh, and good news, folks, this summer, you're going to be able to get a hold of a 150 ml tube, uh, first ever. So keep your eyes out for that. Uh, so it, again, is excellent light fastness. It's completely transparent, Series 3 also, and it is just the PR101. The oxide orange and red are very similar to each other, and you'll see that when I'm working with them. But here, and uh, as well in the demo, you'll notice that the orange is a little bit warmer than the red, a little bit lighter. I love the orange as a replacement for sienna, by the way. It's a great color to work with. Oh, yeah. And then finally, finally, we have the brown. Uh, did you have a question, Emmy? No, nope, I was going to say, I was just agreeing with you that orange is amazing as a, instead of using burnt sienna. Yeah, it's just so much more vibrant. You just, you just yeah, the, the, re the results are really wonderful. Yeah, mm -hmm. sometimes there are some manufacturers that actually use a combination of these two colors to create what they call uh, burnt sienna. So sometimes it pays to flip over the tube and read the color index number to see what you're getting. Right. All right, finally, the transparent oxide brown, 426. So again, excellent light fastness, completely transparent, series three. And here you see the same pigment, PR101. As I mentioned before, depending on the origin of the pigment and its manufacturer, you can get these variations of hue from the same color index number. So something to keep in mind. All right, so those are the four colors that we're gonna take a dive in here pretty soon. All right, the giveaway. Ooh, oh man. Giveaway. I hope you guys are paying attention. This is where, this is where the magic happens. <laughs> <laughs> All right, tell me when you guys are ready for the question. I think oh, I'm not seeing I'm not seeing it yet. Oh, oh no, there there they are. They're all very excited. Okay. Lots of lots of comments. We are ready. All right, we're ready. This is going to be an easy <laughs> one. You you can go and look at your tube of paint. Um, but I mentioned the color index numbers uh, for the ochres and the oxides. Uh, give me the color index number for both the synthetic and the natural inorganic pigments used in the making of these colors. So there are going to be four color index numbers you need to give to get the answer correct. There you go. All right. So everybody put that in the comments in the chat. So make sure you get those correct, because if you don't get them correct, your name is not put in the uh, official giveaway selection hat. I guess that metaphorical hat. I'm going to put it into a jar. How about that? <laughs> but I will pull uh, three names from that selection uh, once we officially get all of the names put in there. And I will make sure to allow everybody to continue to answer up until 15 minutes after the show ends. So uh, whenever we end 15 minutes from there, and yes, your comments are time stamped so I can tell whether or not you are on time. <laughs> you can give even the, the people that are a little bit later a little bit of a chance to uh, rewatch the show and get that answer. All right, so I've got about 15 minutes left, right? Um, I believe yes, yes, about 15 All right. minutes. So I'm gonna kind of speed through this, but uh, feel free to fire some questions off. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is show you the mass tone and undertone of these colors. So you can see that I've already got them laid out here for you. Uh, here I have my uh, transparent oxide yellow. Uh, here is the transparent oxide orange, transparent oxide red, and the transparent oxide brown. And I've just squeezed a bead of each color. This is a black line I did on the canvas board I'm working on here today. Uh, just so we can see the level of transparency. So I'm going to set these colors aside. And I'm going to grab my trusty palette knife here and just going to give you a little look at the mass tone. So the mass right. tone is the color literally right out of the tube. And Emily and I were talking about the real depth mm -hmm. uh, and richness of the mass tones of these colors. Oh, yeah. These are the ones that I use instead of black. 
I love to use these as my dark lift star. this up so you can kind of get a, a more nuanced look at them. So there's the yellow, the orange, the red. You can see those are really close. Mm -hmm. And then the brown, really rich and dark. So that's the mass tone. So let's look at the undertone. And this is where we're going to be able to see the transparency uh, of the color a little better. So there's the yellow. And now you see the yellow, right? So if you were having trouble seeing it before with the undertone, you really get a sense of it. So we'll look at those again. So there's the undertone. And here we see a lot, right? So this is the great thing about undertones. You get a little more sense of the hue, of the temperature of the color. Uh, it's transparency or opacity. And you can see these wonderful earth colors. Isn't that wonderful color? It's gorgeous. And there's the orange and there's the red. And there you can see a little bit of the difference. When they're in their mass tone, they're almost identical. But when you see the undertones, you can see how the orange is just a little warmer. And then mm -hmm. we make our way over the brown. Just a great replacement for an umber. Uh, it really is. Yeah, a nice color to use there. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to show real quickly uh, how you can work with some of these. So I did uh, a couple things ahead of time. In this first uh, one, I just have some mineral spirits, so odorless mineral spirits. In this next one, I mixed in with the elder mineral spirits some linseed oil. Uh, and so I have a combination too. And then this one is a paste. So in terms of layering or glazing, typically artists are going to be working in this method with them. So I'm just going to take some of the uh, solvent first. So this is kind of what an artist would be doing right in the beginning of their painting, you know, creating a tone surface. And I just want to see, show you how this color tones out. So this is the orange. You know, we'll mix in some of the, the yellow there. A nice lean layer. Uh, yeah, so, you know, a lot of artists, especially plein air painters, I know, but even uh, portrait painters uh, will tone their canvases first. Uh, and they wipe away really great uh, in that regard too. So that's a nice undertone uh, to begin your painting, nice lean layer, wonderful uh, kind of even tone to work uh, up your composition. Now I'm going to add in this mixture of oil uh, and the uh, mineral spirits. This is very similar to what you would call a painting medium. So I, I've made my own, but a lot of the bottles of, of mediums that use that say painting medium are traditionally just a mixture of a solvent and linseed oil. So this is how you would create a glaze, right? So mm -hmm. here is a nice way to create a, a more fluid type of paint, self-leveling, nice transparent color. I'm doing kind of a fun brush stroke so you can get a sense of that. So there's an example of how you would create a, a little fatter uh, layer, but still look at the wonderful transparency of that. There you can kind of see the difference, one with just the spirits and the other with the mm -hmm. painting medium. Now, just a quick reminder of what you have in your cups on the right hand side that you're mixing into those paints. So this was just odorless mineral spirits. Mm -hmm. This was odorless mineral spirits mixed with linseed oil. So a general painting medium. And then last, I've got a painting paste. Um, I'm using the Cobra painting paste, which you can use with traditional oils. Uh, there are other painting pastes out there too. Uh, think of it as paint without the pigment, right? Uh, and so this is another way that you can use this wonderful transparent paint with a medium like a paste or a gel or a cold wax and still have a nice transparent layer, but have texture. So I'm gonna use my brush now. I'm gonna kind of come through here and you'll see it's transparent, but I still have the brush stroke. So here was the painting medium and the brush strokes completely level. Here you can see the brush stroke with the paste, but I was able to extend the paint, create that wonderful transparency uh, but still have some texture. That's so fun. So that's a way that you might use these in some of the traditional techniques. Because mm -hmm. right. I did have somebody asking, would you ever tone your canvas with uh, the linseed oil mixed in? Like not a combination of the uh, odorless mineral spirits and linseed oil, but just linseed oil. Traditionally, you tone your canvas with a solvent. Uh, and the reason for that is, is the old fat over lean rule, right? With oil painting, you want to start with a paint that is lean. Uh, and when I say fat or lean, I'm talking about the oil content. Uh, so uh, the leaner the paint is, the less oil, the faster it dries. Uh, 
peroxidizes. Mm -hmm. The more oil you add back into the paint with a painting medium, the fatter the paint is and the slower it dries or oxidizes. So in that toning of the canvas, typically you want a very lean layer. So most artists will use solvent uh, mixed with paint, you know, sometimes a very generous ratio, like one to one uh, or even more sometimes on the solvent side. So it's a very fluid, very lean layer that will dry much more quickly than the layers of paint that you put over it. All right, so let's do some color mixing now. Yeah. Yeah, so I am going to uh, first explain my layout here. So I'm going to put my transparent oxides up on top here, my transparent oxide yellow, orange, red, and brown. And on the side, I've got some primary colors that I'm going to use. And I'll put those out here first. I've got a cad yellow lemon uh, that I'm going to put out. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and do some time constraints. I'm going to put a little bit here, a little bit here. Over here, a little bit here, because we're going to mix each one of these. So every primary color uh, that you pick is going to be different. There are cooler ones, there are warmer ones, right? So the difference, uh, you're going to get different results based on what you're using. This is a CAD red uh, medium. And usually I use ultramarine blue, but I thought I'd get creative and I got the Severus blue. So this should be a fun result here. Um, really bright blue, more of a kind of a primary blue, right? Put a little bit here for each one. All right, so those are the primaries that we're gonna use today. And now I'm gonna go ahead and put my transparent oxides. First, the transparent yellow oxide up here. Uh, I'm doing about a one-to-one -one ratio, so about equal amounts of both. Not scientific, not measuring it out detailed, um, but I'm eyeballing about an equal amount of the color. So now I've got my uh, transparent oxide orange. I'll lay that out up top here. And I'm just gonna go down. And this is a canvas board again that I'm, I'm working on. And then the transparent oxide red. Again, equal amounts or close to it. And then finally, the transparent oxide brown. I'm also going to be tinting these colors with a titanium white, which I'm going to keep right over here. So you'll get a chance to see how these colors tint out uh, as well. All right. Now let's start mixing. Um, first, I just want to spread out a little bit of the color so you'll be able to compare these back to their original. So there's the mass tones again for our a little bit of the undertone there. All right, now let's do our Cad lemon yellow, wonderful opaque color there, isn't it? I'm doing my best to make sure my palette knife is really clean before I go to the next color. There's that red. Look at how <laughs> opaque those colors are. Mm -hmm. Even the undertone. Yeah. Cadims are so opaque. There's the blue. Now, can you remind us again what kind of blue that is? That's a Severus blue. Severus blue. There you go. Nice. Nice color. Mm -hmm. All right, so now let's tint these out. I, I didn't show you that on the last example. I'm just going to add a little pinch of white to each one of these. And you and I were talking about this, Emmy, and how adding white to these really changes the game. Then you can really see how you can integrate these colors um, in different ways in your work. Uh, so first, I'll go ahead and mix some white with the yellow. Now you can see how it's related to yellow ochre, right? Oh, yeah. There's the orange. There's the red. 
there you can see a difference too. When you tint these two out, it really kind of shows you another level of these colors. And then finally the brown. All right, just so we get a sense of the colors that we're mixing with, I did the same thing over here. So you can see how that lemon yellow tints out. And so I get a strength for these cadmium colors. On the surface floor. All right, so there are our colors right out of the tube. Now let's see what we get with our mixture. So here we have our yellow, transparent oxide yellow with our cad lemon yellow. We're going to mix those together. What a lovely color. Isn't that a wonderful color? Mm -hmm. What a great replacement for our yellow ochre out of the tube, right? Now we're going to mix that cad lemon yellow with the orange, transferred oxide orange. Another really beautiful color. Ooh, yes. Like sunlight hit, hitting the side of a hill you know, there. Now with the red, a little more tinting strength there, right? Mm -hmm. All PR 101. More greenish result there, yeah. Nice. So the goal of showing you this is kind of to, to express the potential of these four colors mixed with a limited palette uh, and the you know um, sophistication of the color combinations uh, that you can achieve. So here we've got that transferrin oxide yellow mixed with the cad red. Warms the red up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Makes it a little richer. Here we've got the transfer oxide orange. Just a little deeper again. Cadmium is such a opaque color. It really is, but it's so lovely. Like I just, <laughs> personally, I just want lipstick and all of those, <laughs> all of the cadmiums. I would like all of that, please. But they're just, they're also like, they're such luscious reds that like you could use that to paint all kinds of different things. Like the, the ability to have these in a variety of different artwork, whether you add a, a little bit of a tint of white to the, the mixtures and then uh, use it for skin tones or, you know, lips. Well, look at this beautiful green. Oh, that's pretty. That's pretty. <laughs> Because every time you're on the show, I always just leave and really want to go paint. <laughs> Immediately want to go paint. There's something about watching people mix colors. I mean, it's it's what I think that that first love of painting in general is just mixing the mud together, right? It really is. Now you, here you're talking about the blacks and the grays, the mm -hmm. blues. Um, when you mix with these colors, give these really deep rich colors that make nice substitutes. Oh yeah. Like the one you're mixing right there. If I yeah. if I don't have a darkest dark in the transparent oxides that I need, I'll mix a little bit of blue in just to deepen it just slightly. And it gives you just such a, just a subtle darkness that is not black, but it's just a beautiful tone. So I'm gonna do the same thing here. We get a little bit of time left, right? Almost one minute. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I will let you mix in the white. <laughs> this will definitely give us a, a, a more understanding of what those mixes yeah, really are. Exactly. Yeah. Especially these colors on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I mean, who doesn't like watching you mix the colors? <laughs> <laughs> it's so satisfying. All right, so let's mix some of that white in here. So pretty. Yeah, it's a pretty color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely are getting a lot of oohs and ahs from <laughs> the mixing of the colors. Isn't it fun? <laughs> mm -hmm. like, this is the magic of painting, right? 
It really is. Wonderful variations. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, I mean, if you're talking about doing uh, portraiture work, something like this is going to give you a variety of flesh tones. Oh, yeah. I mean, even in landscapes, that would be lovely. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know? So here, I think we're going to see a nice variation, too. There's, it's going to mm -hmm. go from more of a pink warm up as it goes across. Now, while you are mixing those, we did have someone ask one last time, if you could repeat the giveaway question uh, in case anybody missed, missed it the first time. Sure, so what I'm looking for are the color index numbers for the uh, pigments that we discussed. So we talked about the ochres, the, the iron oxide yellows and the iron oxide reds. Uh, there were four uh, color index numbers, two for the yellow, mm -hmm. two for the red. One was for the synthetic and one was for the natural for each one. Nice. So it's those numbers that begin with a P. Yes, so the, the index codes aren't just the numbers, it's the letters and the numbers. Yep. That was a little hint, hint, cough, cough. If you put in an answer before and you didn't include the letters, you can redo it now look until uh, 15 minutes until we, we leave. Wow, look at those colors. This is wonderful gray. This is a wonderful gray color there. Who would have thought we'd get that kind of a brown? I'm always, you know, every time I try a different color, it's always so fun to see the results. So this was the red and the blue mixed together. You'd think it'd be more of a violet, but here we get this really wonderful brown mixture. And here's the one that was pushing towards black, just a wonderful oh, yeah. warm gray. Oh yeah, you got a nice, nice, lovely gray out of those two combos. I love that. So I'm gonna try to give you the best angle here. Mm -hmm. I mean, even so that one. you can also have a huge variety if you uh, adjust the amount of one, the ratios from one to the other. Right. And right. Yeah, I'm using a, a 50 50 one to one, mm -hmm. so you can make. Uh, push these either way, right? Push them more towards the primary, push mm -hmm. them more towards the, the transparent oxide. How lovely. So mix in some colors. Fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm ready to go paint. I don't know about anything. ready to go paint. <laughs> All right. I'm going to switch cameras here and join you again. All right. I will pop myself up on the camera as well so we can say goodbye to everybody. Yay. That was fun. Yes, thank you so much for that show. Yes. It was it's always such a wealth of information every time you're on here. And I, I love all of the the knowledge you slam into our heads every time. <laughs> <laughs> I love sharing. It's just it's so much fun. I love my job and, and I love uh, working with artists and and learn. I learn so much too, not only from what we're doing, but all the conversations that we have and all the conversations and questions that I get from folks out there it just it really makes it all worthwhile. It definitely shows. So thank you again for, for joining us on the show. We will, of course, you guys know, we're going to definitely have Jeff back on the show, hopefully in person. I'm yes, sorry. yes, so, that'll be great. Quick reminder though, um, as soon as we sign off, 15 minutes, you guys can pop in that answer in case you're watching a little bit later. Uh, I will be pulling the names from the chats and compiling them into a jar where I will pick a win, well, not a winner, three winners, right? Yeah, three winners, three, three winners. winners. We will have three winners. So there's a huge uh, chance of winning. So guys, and make everybody sure you... will get their, their own tubes of paint. Yes. I unfortunately can't be in that mix, but um, that's okay. I'm going to go get my paint anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that will be it. And of course, you guys make sure you uh, subscribe. And if you're watching this later on YouTube and you want to be part of this Whole crazy Jerry's live uh, family. You can always uh, hit the, the notification bell to make sure you are notified every time we go live. So I will see you guys next week, which uh, we are actually, don't forget, we're going to have a really fun, I'm so excited. We have a paint swap challenge oh, with a special fun. guest. So make sure you guys join us next week. And Jeff, I will see you the next time we have you on the show. You bet. Thanks for having me. And thank you everybody for joining today. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.